Well, thank you everybody this morning for taking the time to join us today. And we'll just go right into it. So this, you know, my mantra is cover crops for conservation agriculture. And this has been an enjoyable journey with cover crops for me. So we will just um, proceed. I started in Wisconsin and then Missouri and now I'm in Texas and hopefully continue to do this for quite a while. And it's an important need. So I, I'm glad that our country is, is proceeding in that direction. And that last picture I wanted to show you, the last picture is a cover, winter cover crop mix. And last year it was beautiful. So I wanted to make sure I got some pictures and use them. So I, I just encourage you take a lot of pictures and use them in your PowerPoints. And during this presentation, I'm always, I'm putting, I'm putting things in here for a, almost like a diverse audience. We all here at this meeting know about cover crops and what they are. I'm actually just putting some examples in here for, for a presentation in case you, you want to do a presentation to people or farmers or groups that don't know about cover crops. So you're going to see some slides like, yeah, I know that already, but I put them in here just to help us understand as a group how important this is to communicate science. And if you ever want to use any of these slides, make sure you just email me and you can use them. All you need to do is credit me at the bottom, but I do this so that we can help each other as a team get the word out there because it takes a lot of work to get all this together. So if, if there's someone, I'm a sharer, just so you know, I'm somebody uh, who shares. So if you need any of this stuff, you just email me and I'm willing to share anything. So this is just a slide describing what cover, pardon? Uh, just describing what cover crops are. And this is a slide and these are pictures that I have taken around the country. That's an, I like to do the photography part too. So why are we doing this? And the thing about it is, is after being in, in this field of work for a few decades, there's still a lot of serious erosion problems going on, not let alone soil health and so forth. But if we can, if we can help reduce erosion, we're going in the right direction. So you're gonna, there's water erosion on the left. And it might be your right, but on the left, you can see the water erosion. And that's probably three or four inches deep with sediment. And then the one on the right is actually wind erosion. And this was, uh, that's probably about three or four feet deep. And when I looked across the field, it actually looked like a desert. So these are the reasons why we're doing this. And we need to find ways to improve our water systems. And I'm hoping that our country can get better at this because it's actually a national security issue. Because if we don't have the, the healthy soils and the protected waters, we're gonna be in trouble. And I put this in there too, to, to kind of think about an example of rotation where you live. So if you're communicating this science, you know, how would this fit into a rotation for farmers? Because you know we're doing we're doing research, but we're also doing applied science because we want you know we want greater implementation across our country. So thinking how would this fit into a rotation, and actually talking with extension agents, farmers, and others, and getting a, an idea, a team effort idea of how how can we do this? Where would we start? How would we say a simple way for farmers to start? In resiliency, that's another big reason why we're doing this. We need to have more resilient farms. As we have less resilient farms, it puts farmers at higher risk. And farmers live, you know, they have a risky business. If we can reduce their risk, it will be better. And risk comes in all ways because 
when you know when you have unhealthy soils and a lot of erosion and so forth you need probably need to buy more inputs right you need to more use more herbicides more uh fertilizers and stuff and that costs money to farmers so there's a there's a whole cycle of of how this can help farmers be economically sound and be able to sleep better at night so we need to get that message out and then there's other people too that you know care about the habitat the biodiversity on farms needs to go up in our country and we can do that with cover crops and I don't know if there's other people who's not in the CE2 group, I'm sure there are here, but just a, a picture in some of these slides, a lot of, some of these slides in here are gonna be from Param from Florida. And I think he's the only one that I used his slides to show you some data. But these are all the, these are all the states in CE2. So we have pretty much two Southern states and the rest in the Midwest, Northeast and, uh, Great Lakes region. So this is uh, the first year that we did the Syria ride. This is what it looked like. It was excellent. So you, you definitely can grow good Syria ride down here in Texas. And you can see right away the weed suppression that it does. It does a great job at weed suppression. So year one, we planted the 70 pounds per acre. We actually planted that on September 29th. In year two, I'm gonna show you year two information, but it was much later. And then the dates that we terminated that cereal rye and the weeks before planting corn, okay? So we planted corn on March 22nd. So we had a treatment that is a control, killing two to four weeks before, three to seven days before, and then three to seven days after planting corn. And once again, this is year one. Great looking cereal ride. This, I think on the right, that was a first collection date. And on the left, I think that might've been the last. So you can see how much biomass and that can be, that may be a problem with corn. And our first year data for collecting the grain information on the corn, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the field managers do that for me, but we did not get the data. Something with the computer, which I was sad about. Okay, so um, the first year, this is Param's data. You can see Texas here with the early, late and post plant. So we had a lot of cover crop biomass and uh, we had a lot of rain that year. So rain equals great biomass. And same with the other states. You know, most of them had really good biomass for, for, the, uh, for the treatments. And then for this is, um, I think this is for the, yeah, this is for the weeds. So the weeds, you know, we, we pretty much did not have any weeds because the cereal rye is doing a great job. But then when the corn got to the V5 stage, uh, hold on, I have to move this little thing on my screen to see something. There. Okay, so the control, you know, and, and this is the way it is in the South, once we get rain and it starts warming up, the weeds just come on profusely in the in the south. So we had a lot of a lot of weeds in the control with no cover crop. But you can see these these other timings. We had we had hardly any weeds at all. So year two, we planted on November 19th. Now that fall, we had a drought. So what I've noticed in the South is that there's a pattern, and I don't know if this is happening, Carlene, in Florida too, but there seems to be a pattern of um, a wet spring, some rain in the summer, and then when you get in August, September, and October, you start, it's like droughty in the fall. So that's what, that's what I've been seeing. 
And uh, so we, we did the, you know, the kill dates were pretty much the same. And to be honest with you, the, the serial rye was big enough. But I noticed that the data, in the data, and I was looking at that this last week, that the first, the first, um, the first cover crop biomass, that, that amount of biomass was comparable to the year before, but the ones, but the ones in the later, the later harvesting of the biomass, we had much less. But the weeds were still being suppressed. So what that's telling me without, you know, doing the statistical data on this is you can plant through your eye later. It will still do the weed suppression in the spring. But then you think about like how long will the residue last? But I still think it will it, it helps because in the south, you're having weed seed development for a lot longer across the across the growing seeds. The growing seeds. Because of fall, you're going to have more weeds because it's still producing seed. So you can help suppress weeds in the fall, in the winter, and in the early spring. Okay, well, I am actually going to switch now because the insects in the in the um, in the south, fire ants have a major effect on on so many things. And I want to show you a movie. I tried probably ten times to get this movie in the PowerPoint to work, and it wouldn't. But I do want to show you that. I'm going to share it on another screen. Let's see, new share. Please, please be patient. Um, there. Okay, can you see the movies? It looks like you can. So I'm going to show you this movie. And hopefully, this is big enough. Hold on. Come on. Can you see them carrying away the, the wax worm? Can everybody see no, that? Because I can't. No, we just see the library with the files. We just see the library. Okay, let's let's try this again. Okay, we're gonna do this again. Yes, we can see it now. Okay. Okay, so, so fire ants are a major issue here in Texas. So they are carrying away the waxworm. And the first, you, you know, we put these out three times. The first time when I go back in the morning, I would say 95% of them are gone and I see this activity. The second time that I put them out, they're pretty much can smell, they can smell them now. And then they, they, they're gone. I'm gonna show you another movie. Can you see this movie? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh I wanted to show you that because I'm sure now of course I didn't do research on this. Let's see. Okay. I want to get back to my I want to get back to my PowerPoint and close this. So, uh, like I said, this has a major effect on on the ecology here. So you're not seeing, you know, you're not really seeing many beetles. I'm not seeing. Uh, no, why can't let, let me get back to this, please? Hold on. I need to share. Our point. 
Yeah. Okay, you should be able to get back to my PowerPoint here. Is that right, everyone? You can see the PowerPoint again? Yes. Okay. So um like I said, this is a made this is a major issue issue here in Texas. And I'm I would like to do research on this, but of course I don't I don't really have the time to do it. It's my last year. But there's a this definitely has an effect on biodiversity here in Texas. And Carlene, I don't know if you're seeing the same. Maybe you can comment on that when I'm done. But and here we're doing the, the seedling disease. All right. So we're looking at disease here. That's actually my daughter who was nice enough to help me. And that's a, just an above view of the cereri. Okay, so that, that's kind of like an overview of CE2. The corn, if I, so far the, the two years that I have seen the project of CE2, what I've seen is, is terminating two to four weeks before the corn seems to, seems to be the best for corn. And it does adequate uh, weed suppression. But we will see what the, uh, what the end result will be after the three years. But that's kind of what I have observed so far. All right, let's get into a little bit about some other cover crop work that I'm doing. I'm actually looking at four summer and five winter mixes and the control plots. So this is a random, a randomized complete block design with four replications. We have uh, four summer and five winter mixes and then a control plot with no weeds and then a weedy check. And you can take just a minute to read this vision and th that's the vision that I have for our country. And there's a farmer there. Uh, this is a farmer in Texas with his boot there by his young cotton. And he has been using cover crops up in the up in the panhandle probably for about seven years. And I don't, he will never return to not using cover crops. And he has now integrated sheep and animals and so forth. And uh, these are some of my undergrad research team. Uh, they have it so the undergrads can get help and they're helping me count the, count the cover crop plants. So the challenge here in Texas is a long growing season. Okay, that means we have weeds emerging after the harvest, just like probably in most, most other places now, because the weeds are, remember those weeds are very genetically plastic and they can do so many things to adapt. So the question is, can co summer cover crop species work well? Okay, to help that. So that would be here in Texas, the corn is harvested at the end of July or the middle of July then planting a cover crop then and having that through the fall. And then this of course dies by frost. So a farmer doesn't have to do a lot of work to be able to terminate this cover crop, okay? So in 2021, the data is showing this. So on the right, you're gonna see the species in the mixes and mix four did not have any grass. So that biomass was not as big. Okay, so mix two and three did the best. When you had the, the grasses, the legumes, and the broadleafs together, they did the best in, pro in producing the biomass. But what I did notice in these species, being more specific, is that the millets had a very hard time expressing themselves. They are very small seeded, and this was a silty soil, so it was really hard to see those species in that mix and mix one. The per, the um, the pearl millet did fine, but the German and proso millet, I did not hardly see any of that. And same with the sesame. sesame. So the sorghum, the cowpeas, sun hemp, 
the pearl millet, those perform the best. And then in 2022, and I wanna show you this too. So if you look at the biomass produced, like 10,000, um, 5,000, you will, you will see that, you know, that is a lot. And then compared to year two, which was planted later and it was droughty, look how much less biomass I have. So timing of planting is crucial. And the thing about it is, is, you know, the field manager here is like, well, should we wait for a rain? Should we not wait, wait for a rain? But um, what I've decided is you need to plant it. Because waiting, and if you're doing summer cover crops, waiting just seems to not work well. Okay, so you can see in, mix, in, in year two, we had a lot less biomass. And mix one did pretty well that year. Okay, compared, but mix four without the grass, you can still see it was less biomass. And that relates back to the weeds now. So this is a weed biomass, all right? The weedy check, of course, had a lot more weeds. And then mix four, the, that's the one without the grass. And that had a lot more weed biomass. And then mix two and mix three was very much helping keep down the weeds. And same with mix one. So the bottom line is this, have a grass in the mix. In a summer cover crop, have a grass in the mix. But when we talk about details now, so if, and I'm just gonna give you an example. If we have sorghum, do not like put a high percentage in because then your other species won't be able to develop and express themselves. So you think you need to think about how you're putting that mix together in the, the proportions and ratios of those species. And then in 2022, once again, um, the mix two and three was keeping down the weeds pretty good compared to the weedy check. So just remember the weedy, the weedy check, I'm, I'm harvesting these summer cover crops either at the end of November or the end of December, right before the frost. So that is a lot, they're producing a lot of weed biomass in the fall. So if we can have cover crops in the fall in the South here, that would really help uh, decrease the weed in their production and then reduce the amount of weed seed that you're gonna get in the seed bank. Okay, because we need to, the root problem is that weed seed bank and we wanna address that. That's another right reason we have to remember Cover crops are something we want to talk about long term. You know, trying it for three years, we need to start start small, help the farmer, but finish strong so that he wants to keep doing it. Because persistence in using cover crops is the key. And then there's some summer cover crops there. And that was probably in February you know, after, after it died back. But you can see if you can get good biomass, it will last until that corn is planted at the end of February. And then, you know, that so that first herbicide treatment they typically do, maybe they could skip that one and save money that way. And you can kind of see this too, the percent ground cover. So I went out every two weeks and looked at the percent ground cover in one meter quadrats in these different mixes. And mix one um, afterwards, you know, it didn't start off with a lot. Mix one and mix four. Mix four was the one with no grasses. Mix one had all grasses, but then some of those millets didn't perform. So you, you can see that you started off low. And then when the corn was planted on March 22nd, it went down pretty fast. And also, and a lot of you know this, if we get a lot of rain in the spring, you're going to have just the, the decomp decomposition rates are just going to be higher. So the residue is not going to last as long. Mix two and mix three, that's the one with the legumes and the broadleaves and the grasses. That stuck around after that corn better. 
okay, to provide that after corn planting weed suppression until that corn canopy can close and, and do a lot of its own weed suppression. So back to that question, the answer is yes, but make sure grasses are in the mix, okay? And what can this research contribute? Actually in Texas, there is not a lot of like long-term research and stuff on cover crops where we're getting enough data to like make extension publications and so forth. So, so that's a need in Texas because when I came to Texas and started this research, when I looked for an extension bulletin or anything in their like corn growing, um, their corn growing, you know, recommendation books, their cotton recommendation books, any of those, there is nothing on cover crops to help farmers get going. So that is a real need in Texas. So developing those out outreach publications is crucial here to, and communicating it, you know, at farmer meetings, that needs to be done. So the key, the, you can read the key points, but there's challenges with this, okay? So droughty conditions at planting is a real issue. You need to plant around a rain or else provide supplemental irrigation. And you also need to check for insect pressure in the fall on, on these cover crops, because I have seen them I mean, there are certain species that are really attracting insects like mustards. The cucumber beetles, they just love, you know, they really like them. So you need to, in flea beetles, you need to be checking your cover crops in the fall for insects. And I just wanted to uh, throw this in here, showing you that year one precipitation, we had 33 inches, year two, 19. We had 42% less rain in 2022. And you can see this is, this is my mantra to, you know, have farmers enjoy doing it and that they can get the benefits and that we can help them along the way and help each other along the way. That's what, that's what the PSA is all about is helping each other along the way and then helping, you know, helping the farmers. In this picture, you can just see, you know, the cereal rise on the right. And then you have a lot of weeds where there's no cover crops. And you, you know, and this is of course, the one on the left is most prevalent here in Texas, there's not, uh, I, you know, there's a, a great opportunity in Texas for more cover crops. And the other research I'm doing is fiber hemp. So cereal rye and fiber hemp, they don't get along too good. Uh, you can see the difference in the height of those plants with the cereal rye there. You, you see how high the cereal rye got. And the cereal rye is doing a great job at suppressing weeds. But the hemp at a young age is not conducive to the cereal rye. Now, I'm doing another study with single species cover crops. And it really likes the legume before the hemp. So cow peas before hemp, winter peas before hemp. Hairy vetch, not so much, but those other two species do well. And hemp is a great competitor with weeds, not sunflowers though. Sunflowers will definitely, in Johnson grass, definitely outcompetes uh, fiber hemp. But uh, in this, once again, just another good picture showing you what kind of weed suppression ability these cover crops have. So this is how big fiber hemp can get, 10 to 12 feet tall. So there's a lot of things that have to go on with fiber hemp, but I, I think it's another great conservation crop that hopefully that we can get into rotations in our country and get it into products, cars, airplanes, concrete, houses, paper, all kinds of things and have less plastic. So that's my vision for the fiber hemp is more fiber hemp, less plastic. 
Okay, so fiber hemp. This is a split plot design with four replications with and without cereal rye. All right, and I'm also testing a pre-herbicide at the Floralin. And there is not any approved herbicides for fiber hemp right now from EPA, okay? And then also looking at planting dates because this is a new crop, it is photo period sensitive. So you have to figure out when to plant this. And it's very variety specific, okay? So I'm trying varieties from China and Australia and Italy. And I'm also looking at, um, well, that's just for the cover crop mixes. I went over that already. But I want you to look at that picture. Look at what a good job that fiber hemp does at suppressing its own weeds. Really good job. And you can see that the, in this chart, what I want to point out, this is a very busy, usually I don't like to show this kind of stuff, but um, if you have cereal rye only, and this is the height in centimeters of the hemp, okay? So with the cereal rye, you're having, you know, it, it's making effect on the growth of the hemp in the beginning here with the dates here. But what I want to show you here is that the weedy check that means there was no cover crop, no pre-herbicide, and that fiber hemp is doing a great job on its own suppressing its weeds and plus growing well. So it can really grow profusely if we have enough rain and it can outcompete weeds. But you know, it needs those two things. It needs rain and you need to be able to get it a good start. And once again, you know, this, and this was a farmer in Texas. So he's growing fiber hemp and that's the insulation. So that's insulation uh, made out of fiber hemp. And then that's just me getting data because you're going to, now this is a dioecious species. So you have male and female plants out in the field. And you have to be careful too, because of neighbors that are growing CBD hemp. They don't want anything pollinating their CBD hemp. So there's those, there's issues with that too. And I just want to remind everybody here that I know you all know this here, but still, this is just good to make sure that we're talking about why we're doing this. And anyone can use this slide too. All right. Well, I like communicating science and I'm ready for any questions if you have them.